Well, welcome to the uh, 2023 Western Neuropathy Association webinar. Uh, this is our first for this year, and we hope the, this will be a very exciting and interesting um, a webinar. I think that you'll have a lot of good information. Today's presentation is on driving adaptations, and the presenter is Megan Frazier. Megan is an occupational therapist and driver, driver rehabilitation specialist, a Texas, a Texas driving instructor, and adjunct professor at the University of Mary Harden Baylor. She was named the uh, Texas Occupational Therapist of the Year in 2021. She has a passion for helping people maximize their independence with driving. Megan believes that everyone should be given the opportunity to reach their maximum level of independence with community mobility and driving. Because of this belief, Megan has, was inspired to open Functional Stability and Mobility in 2018 and HD Driving School in 2022. Also, we're going to have a, a short uh, uh, presentation by a Western Neuropathy Association member, Lynn Carpenter. Lynn will be discussing her own experience with converting to hand controls. Uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, we will then fo focus on answering questions uh, as much as possible within the timeline. So please hold your questions till the end. Please feel free to set them into the, the question and answer area, and we'll start queuing them until that, that particular point in time. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Megan to take over the screen and then she will be doing her PowerPoint. So Megan, thank you. Welcome. All right, there you go, sorry. No, <laughs> I had myself on mute and couldn't figure out how to get myself off. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, so. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited um, to speak with you about driving and um, hand controls, left foot accelerators, adaptive equipment. Um, I love what I do. I'm very fortunate um, to be an occupational therapist and be able to help people on a daily basis um, get back to driving and maximize their independence and be able to keep driving longer, especially um, when a medical condition arises. Um, and really affects their ability to continue to drive, um, that can be quite devastating for people. So um, being able to access another way to continue driving um, and being out in the community is really exciting, not just for me, but for the people that I'm working with. Um, so thank you so much. Hopefully this is some information you haven't heard before. I will try to give you kind of a wide overview today of what's out there, what people like myself do, um, what neuropathy, how neuropathy itself might just impact your driving, things to look for, to be aware of um, as it progresses, um, potential DMB, um, DPS kind of um, regulations for neuropathy. I'm in Texas, we call it the DPS. Um, so I know in California, it's the DMV. So if you hear me interchange those, that's why. Um, I think resources are always really, really important. Um, so I will give you guys some resources on where to find additional information, especially driving rehab specialists in California or any other state that you're located in. Um, and then I have a kind of a secondary PowerPoint that I'm going to hopefully be able to pull up for you just so you can see some pictures of what different um, controls look like because um, just hearing about hand controls, left foot accelerator, that can be a little overwhelming for people. Um, so at least having a visual of what that might look like um, kind of helps bring down um, any anxiety surrounding that. So I'll give you guys some pictures for that towards the end. Um, as Daryl said, I'm an occupational therapist by training. I have been in OT for almost 20 years. Um, about six years ago, um, I kind of fell into the driving area um, and have been doing that primarily since then. Um, I do own a driving school as well here in Texas, um, and about a third of my clients are medically complex. Um, another third is kind of the older adult population, and then the, um, the last third is teenagers, um, young adults with neurodiversity. Um, driving is huge, um, and I think it's kind of this area that medical providers are kind of scared to talk about, um, because as adults, especially in America, especially here in Texas, um, it's how we access things. It's our independence. It's our ability to get in a car, go wherever we want, whenever we want, and not have to ask anybody to take us there. Um, so when that is, there's a question that that might be taken away, um, that's really scary for a lot of people. So medical providers have a hard time bringing that up um, because there is a, a really strong emotional component to that. Um, the 
kind of that baby boomer population and their parents are the first population really to have access to vehicles. Um, so that 85, 90 year old adult, um, they do not have that same kind of um, attachment to vehicles as the baby boomer population did. You know, we all remember our first car. Mine was a Chevy minivan, um, but we all can remember back to what our first car was, maybe the first date we went on, where we drove to, um, the, our unfortunately our first accident um things like that so we have a lot of memories tied in um, with our vehicles as well so they're um in america we have a, a really strong attachment to to vehicles and kind of how that interplays with our lives so what are some typical challenges for drivers um, when we do start seeing challenges regardless of what the medical condition is but especially with neuropathy uh, making left turns is typically one of the first places that we see left turns are extremely difficult. Um, it's visually, you have to know what's going on, but then also from um, being able to react quickly, get that foot from the brake over to the gas pedal, turn that wheel at the same time. So if you have any neuropathy in your hands or your feet, being able to coordinate all of those movements can be difficult. Um, driver distraction people are having to pay more attention to what their body is doing. So therefore they're paying less attention to what's going on around them driving at dusk or dawn, um, just because a lot of driving is taking in what's coming to us visually. And at dusk or dawn, um, our visual senses are um, diminished because we're not getting um, as much light. We're not seeing that contrast as often. Merging into another lane, whether it's right or left, requires a lot of coordination. It requires the ability to modulate speed and braking. Um, you have to have the ability to turn, um, look over your shoulder, so good range of motion, um, good tracking. Uh, if you're having any pain or discomfort, being able to do those quick movements um, when you're merging in can be difficult. Um, failing to yield to right away, so processing information quickly, um, recognizing that if you're at a stop, a yield, or a merge, people are coming towards you, what is the rate that they're coming, what lane are they in, and having to process that information quickly can be challenging, especially if um, maybe you're on some medication that might impair that ability. So driving in the body. Um, typically for someone like me, driving is kind of broken down into three separate components. Physically, how is your body reacting and what can we do? How is that impacting your ability to drive? Your cognition, you know, how is your brain working? How quickly are you thinking? Um, can you remember, problem solve, navigate? And then of course your vision of, are you seeing what's coming towards you and how are you processing that? So things that we look for as driving specialists when we're looking at the body is um, someone's strength. Can they physically turn the wheel? Do they have the strength to put a lot of pressure onto the brake or the gas quickly um, in order to stop the car? flexibility. Can you pivot back and forth between the brake and the gas pedal? Um, endurance. Are you fatiguing? You know, if you go into the, if you are able to drive to the doctor's office, which is great, but then um, you sit in the waiting room, you talk to the doctor, if you have a couple of tests, and then you have to drive home in traffic, that might be th a three hour, four hour process. And by the time you get home, you're really tired and you're fatigued or maybe your pain is setting in. Um, so your endurance comparatively between when you started out and when you're getting home is diminished and it's changed. So something to consider. Of course, reaction time, it's not only really a reaction time of brake to gas pedal, but it's also how quickly can you steer the wheel away from maybe a hazard. And then of course, range of motion, both of your legs, your arms, your hips, your head, can you turn and look over your shoulder? Um, so it's a full body range of motion. Also range of motion, can you get in and out of the car? And how difficult may that be for you? And um, as far as the equipment goes, if we're installing equipment into the vehicle, how is that equipment sitting in your steering column or is it on the floor? And do you have the ability to move your body around that equipment? So how does neuropathy affect some of these components? Pedal confusion, um, that's not knowing where your foot is in space. Um, as a personal example, I had a client had neuropathy in his feet after a spinal cord um, surgery. And he, we cleared him. He did great, you know, using the gas pedals. But about a month later, he called and he said, Megan, um, I, I know I did really well. He said, but I just got into a really minor accident. I went to go move my foot from the brake to the gas pedal and my foot got stuck and I couldn't move it quick enough and I couldn't find the, the gas pedal. And he said, you know, I really need to move to hand controls. 
So even though we initially did really well with his feet, we ended up moving to hand controls um, because he didn't want to have to worry. And he didn't want to have to um, worry, is that pedal confusion or that slipping off the pedal going to happen again? Um, he didn't want that responsibility and he didn't want that anxiety around that. So being able to feel the pressure, um, how much, you know, are you stopping hard and everybody's jerking in the car? Um, I always tell my teenagers, pretend there's a cake sitting in the back seat. You know, are we ending the day with a bunch of cake in our hair or is the, the three-tiered cake staying on the back of the seat? Um, and then I've already kind of hit on fatigue and pain. That is something where when you're starting out, you may, may not have any difficulties with driving, but over time or after you go run your errands or go to the doctors, um, you might have more fatigue and pain, um, but then you don't have anything left in the gas tank to do the rest of your day. Um, so taking that into consideration as well. Onset of weakness while driving. Um, weakness in arms, legs, or both, and being able to steer and push the pedals. Steering is big. You know, we all, um, <laughs> usually I have older adults on these types of calls. Um, so we remember when steering, um, we didn't have, we had to like pull the steering. It wasn't automatic steering. Um, so we had to put more pressure into it, which thankfully um, most people have automatic steering. We don't have to do that as much, but it still takes some strength to get that wheel around. Getting in and out of the vehicle. And of course, just slower reaction time. And that could be both physically, your reaction time is slower, but then also maybe the medication that you're taking um, could be impacting that. Falls and driving. Um, this is something that I like to point out because it's often overlooked. Um, falling is a huge indicator of people having accidents. Older adults who have fallen are 40% 40 more, 40 more likely to have an accident than those people who have not fallen, um, which is crazy. We don't think about it. Um, and the reason is falls affect people's mental well being. Um, it makes people more fearful. Um, falls can result in injury, which reduces mobility. So being able to move our arms and legs. Um, also, it can result in changes in driving behavior because you are fearful and that then follows you into the car. Maybe you, um, you're slower at reacting to things because you're afraid of what might happen. The other thing is people fall for a reason, you know, healthy young adults do not fall. So if someone's falling, it's falling because of weakness or coordination changes or vision changes or sensation changes. Um, and that is why falling and driving is so highly correlated. Driving and medication. Um, a lot of medications will increase a client's risk um, of accidents. So neurotin, for instance, some of the side effects are trouble staying alert, difficulty concentrating, um, being able to maintain con control of the vehicle, or even changes in demeanor. Maybe you are um, more agitated, which leads to road rage, or maybe you are more aggressive behind the wheel than you would have been otherwise. Prescription drugs are most prevalent um, of all drugs found in drug drivers involved in fatal crashes. I think that that's really important to set in because people think of distracted driving and drugged driving um, and they think it's illicit driving, but it's not that. Almost half of those accidents are caused by prescription drugs, not necessarily illicit drugs. Um, I want to point this out. Roadwise RX is a fantastic website. It helps you understand how your medications affect your driving. It's completely free. You can go to this website that's listed, type in your medications, um, and it will tell you whether or not it has the potential of impacting your driving ability. Um, there's also other components that are super helpful, like drug interactions and things like that that are on there. Um, but this one in particular will um, look at safety with driving and um, interactions between driving and medications. So as far as requirements, people always ask me, you know, what are the state requirements for driving? Well, being from Texas, my requirements um, for driving are different than yours in California. Um, and that it's the same even when you get your license as a teenager. Um, what you have to do is, is different per state. However, every state has some sort of requirement when they're looking at medically involved patient clients that are looking to drive, and then also the equipment that's being installed into the vehicle and how that needs to be done. Um, there, each state has a DPS or a DMV, so the, the actual entity that looks at issuing and revoking licenses, but then there's also what they call a medical advisory board, which is a group of physicians um, that give recommendations to the DPS slash DMV on what um, should be allowed and not be allowed. Um, for clients with medical conditions. 
So in the state of California, um, of course, you're, there's a driver proficiency test that's recommended um, to determine if driving impairments will cause weakness or sensory loss. Um, typically, there's a periodic review um, because a, for a lot of clients, um, neuropathy is progressive. So they want to make sure that um, you're still safe and proficient with driving. Um, and that is each state dependent on how often that review is done. Um, so I put the link for the, DP, the DMV in California here for you um, on each of these slides if you actually wanted to go and, and visit the, um, the website itself. Um, so the next couple of um, slides are going to describe what the DMV will take into account for driver evaluations um, within the actual state of California. So the DMV refuses to issue or renew a driver's license to someone who cannot safely operate a vehicle due to reasons related to uh, medical conditions, permits DMV to administer certain tests and perform a driving area eval. So this is basically saying the vehicle code is saying that the DMV does have the authority to say, hey, you know, you have neuropathy, I need you to come in and take a test um, to show that you are proficient in driving even though um, despite having neuropathy, um, and they're the ones that can set um, the parameters um, and what those tests should look like. Uh, they also can start an investigation. So if you come in to renew your license, they notice you're using a walker or a cane or a wheelchair, um, they can send a referral up to the medical ad advisory board to start an investigation on, hey, what is going on with this and are these people still safe? So what qualifications do they use to investigate or re-examine drivers? Uh, there's three different components and I kind of hit on this already. The physical requirements, the strength, coordination, stamina, and mobility. There's the sensory functions. Um, so visual, can you take in what's coming all around you? How quick are you with um, seeing and responding to those things? Auditory, are you able to hear or are you hearing impaired? And then tactile, do you have sensory loss in your hands or your feet? Mentor requirements. Um, so they want to know, are you, how quickly are you taking in all of that information and processing it and making decisions? Um, are you getting distracted? Can you focus on what's going on around you? Um, proper associations of thought. You know, if you're driving and all of a sudden a car pulls out in front of you and, and then all of a sudden you notice that there's also a pothole, are you able to make really quick decisions and look behind you and see, is it safe to turn um, into the left lane? Um, so being able to process everything that's going on around you quickly. Um, appropriate judgment, um, navigate. You know, if there is a detour, um, I know in California, you guys have lots of traffic um, in a lot of the areas. So if there's a detour or um, a traffic snarl, can you navigate and um, find another route to where you want to go? DMV, um, the physical and uh, mental conditions. DMV considers all of these conditions independently and together in order to arrive at a decision. Um, there must be sufficient facts to support, um, support any actions. Um, so what they're saying here is they're not just going to pull someone's medical um, driving record and make a decision. And um, they're not going to say, oh, well, this person had one traffic violation, so we're going to revoke their license. Um, they're looking at everything all together and how people do in each of these scenarios. So they want to know characteristics of driving. Um, are you driving locally? Are you driving on highways? How fast are the roads that you normally travel? Um, what are the distances? Um, I know a lot of my clients... Um, are rural, so um, a lot of them do not live in large cities, and they only want to drive a mile down the road to the grocery store and then a mile home, so we put radius restrictions, um, and then I also might put, you know, they're not going to drive at night or on roads greater than 55 miles an hour. Um, area of residence, urban versus rural, is really big with me here in Texas. Um, amount of time spent driving, which is huge for someone who has fatigue, um, time of day, um, I will tell clients, I don't want you driving at rush hour. I don't want you driving at night. Um, we have really bad sun glare here um, at dusk and dawn. So a lot of times I'll say, hey, I don't want you driving at dusk or dawn either. Um, and then availability to food, sleep, medication. So if someone, if I know going in from the physicians that someone is um, inconsistent with their medication, they're not sleeping at night, um, those things can lead to dehydration, um, confusion, and um, can then affect their their. Driving ability. Um, 
compensating factors. So um, these are the, the equipment that we're going to talk about. You know, the, what type of vehicle people are going to be driving, automatic transmission, um, types of hand controls. And these are some of the things that I'm going to show you on this other on the other PowerPoint is types of control. So steering knobs. Um, let me see if I had one present. So the steering knob. Um, it sits on the driving on the wheel. Um, hand controls and hand controls can be figured in an innumerable way, um, numbers of ways. They can be left hand and right hand and floor mounted and steering wheel knobs, steering mounted and vertically and horizontally. And um, so it can be very, uh, it, everything is very person dependent. And that's why it's so important to have an evaluation done by a driving and um, specialist because they're going to look at what do you specifically need for your individual circumstances and come up with those things for you. Extra mirrors, power steering. Most cars come with power steering now, so that's not a big issue, but um, adjustment in physical habits. So scanning techniques, following distances, choice of lanes, break of juices. And that's where someone, um, we always do training with clients is teaching them um, you know, I always say it's driving, driving training, driving lessons for adults because we develop bad habits as we get older and learning some of these techniques that we, one, might not have learned when we were younger or two, kind of got into some bad habits. Um, adjustments of driving environment. I've already kind of hit on some of these um, hour, day, hour of the day. Um, how far weather conditions is also something. I know you guys have been having tons and tons of rain. Um, so if there's some flooding, maybe you don't go out that day. Um, changes of routes, um, maybe not taking the interstate and taking um, what we call access roads, so not as busy road. Um, and then maybe only doing um, one trip, um, go to one place um, and adjusting your schedule rather than doing, you know, 10 errands at once. And a bunch of different things that we can recommend. They can recommend that you have an examination on a specific date. They can put you on a medical probation. Driver must comply with the medical regime regime and report any changes um, to the DMV. Sorry, I think I'm having internet connection difficulties. Let's see. Um, you guys still got me, hopefully. Um, Sorry, I think hopefully I didn't lose you. No, we're still here. Okay, perfect. Sorry, thank you. It was no, slowing okay. on my end and it popped up, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go back to that last side. Um, limited term licenses. So they may only say that you get one or two years before um, you need to come back in and get reevaluated. Um, I know here in Texas, there are certain medical conditions, um, like for instance, mild cognitive impairment or dementia. At a minimum, clients need to be reevaluated every year, if not every six months. Um, so, looking at the state, um, and specifically, they might individually put a specific recommendation on how often you need to get reevaluated. And then, unfortunately, they may suspend or revoke the license, um, depending on the complexity of the case. So warning signs, people want to know, okay, well, I think I'm okay behind the wheel, but what are some things that maybe um, I should be looking out for? Um, if this is you in this picture, we, we need to talk. <laughs> um, hopefully, um, this isn't anybody on the call, but um, so other additional warning signs, inappropriate driving speeds. Um, if your family member is holding on to the, um, the door next to them and, and pressing their imaginary brake, that might be an indication that you're driving too fast. Or if um, you look in the rearview mirror and there's a bunch of cars stacked up behind you, you might be going a little too slow. Um, accidents or near misses. Um, and that could be as simple as every time you pull into a parking spot, um, the person that's parked next to you. Have their car. To me, you didn't get into an accident, um, but you were really close to hitting that person. And that kind of just ties in with the next one, the difficulty parking. Um, other drivers are honking their horns at you. Um, that does happen. Um, a lot of clients will get on highways or, or quicker roads and they'll say, well, I'm going to go slower because I'm safer. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, here in Texas, kind of the rule is eight miles 
an hour below the posted speed limit. So if the posted speed limit is 75, if you're going, you know, 65 and a 75, you're considered a danger um, and you can actually be ticketed for that. Um, ticketed and moving violations, accidentally stepping on the wrong pedal. Um, so things you're looking at are, um, you know, all of us have had an issue at one point or another, a minor thing. Um, but when we're looking at these warning signs, frequency and severity. So is it happening more often? Um, are the misses getting closer each time? Um, are there changes um, in your driving skills? Are you noticing that you're struggling more? You're, it's good to look for patterns. Um, if you're scared or someone else around you is scared, um, that that's a, should be a concern. Um, you want to start tracking changes over time. Um, and I think the last one is really hard because we don't want to hear when we're doing something wrong. Um, but having that open communication with a partner and family is really important um, and being open to what they're saying, even though it might not be something that you want to hear um, is, is super important. Um, Self-assessment tools. I had no idea that what a three point turn is, so I just drove in a circle three times. <laughs> um, I think being open to self-assessment tools and being honest is, is the important part. Um, unfortunately, statistics don't really support that people are, are honest in these assessments, but if you're, you go in and say, you know what, um, I'm really gonna be honest and see what it comes up with, then um, it can be quite valuable. Uh, AAA, AARP um, have different toolkits that you can go into safer driving. Um, we talked about this the um, the panel. I'm going to share these slides so you'll have access to all of these assessment tools um, as well after this. So what can you do to improve your driving skills? Um, that's something you can do today. Um, adjust your driving time. Give yourself more time to get places. You know, don't leave in the last minute. Um, recognize if it's going to be a high traffic volume time of day and adjust your tri driving time to that giving yourself enough time to get appointments, choose your routes intentionally, um, be aware of any road closures or construction, um, and maybe choose not to take those routes. And it might be a little bit longer of a route, but it's not gonna be as stressful, which then can maybe negatively impact something that's going on with you physically. Um, be aware of your symptoms, maybe keep a log of when you're feeling your best and travel during those times of day. Um, have a plan if you need help. If you start to get tired or you have increased pain and you're like, I just can't do this. My feet are burning. I need to stop. Have a plan so you can have somebody else to call um, and where you can leave your car and someone can come get you if necessary. Um, AAA, ARP have programs. Um, CarFit is another great opportunity to kind of start that discussion. CarFit is free. It's a um, collaboration with AAA, AARP, and the American Occupational Therapy Association. And um, it is to fit your car to you. So they look at where the steering wheel is, how your um, car seat fits across you. Uh, is your seat high enough? Can you see over the wheel? Are you at optimal space for turning the wheel? Are you hitting the pedals correctly? Um, and those are completely free events. You can take a state defensive driver's course. Um, usually you get a discount with the AAA um, driver safety course. Other things I like to point out, um, being an occupational therapist, talk to your physician. Uh, make sure that they're okay with you driving or if they have any concerns because you do not want something written in your medical record that there is a concern about your safety with driving because that's in your medical record. And heaven forbid you get into an accident um, and that your physician's writing, they're not safe to drive, concern about, you know, um, sensation in the lower extremity. Um, having those open conversations and that dialogue with your physician is really important. Um, making sure your medication won't impact your driving. Um, and if you're taking a medication that's making you drowsy, make sure that you're planning your routes if you are needing to drive when that medication um, is titrating off or you're not as drowsy. Um, if you are not driving and you wanna get back to driving, make sure you talk to your physician about that and any concerns. Um, also ask therapy. If you're having any deficits that you're concerned about, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, they can help you with energy conservation, range of motion, strength, coordination. Um, I love, love outpatient therapy. So um, definitely if you are um, having difficulties at this point or you're concerned, talk to your, any of your um, rehab therapists that you're working with. 
what can you do? If you, you want to improve your driving skills, you can make an one like my son. Um, so occupational therapist, driver rehab specialist. Um, thanks to these compensatory strategies, I learned that my OT driving specialist and I'm back on the road. So what are OT driving rehab specialists? We are occupational therapists first, and then we went and had additional training on um, how to assess driving and community mobility. So we're looking at how does your peripheral neuropathy affect your ability to drive? What does it look like physically, mentally, um, emotionally, and socially? Um, and then also sensation-wise, we teach people how to use adaptive hand controls, um, and most of us are um, members of the Association of Driver Rehab Specialists and the American Occupational Therapy Association. So what does an eval look like? Um, typically, you start with a clinical evaluation that allows us to look at um, all of the components like physically, mentally, and, and what's going on with you. Um, in your body and then that way when we get in the car we can see okay well what does that look like in the vehicle and how do we need to adapt the vehicle to you to keep you safe um, and driving longer so equipment these are hand controls um, this would be a left hand control um, with hand controls it's always a push forward and then a pull back to accelerate forward you know stop in the name of love um, and then a pull back and this is um, a push forward, pull back um, one. Let's see what else. These are two pictures of my vehicle. Um, this one right here on the left, this is a push rock. So you would push to brake, pull back to gas. Up on the upper right corner um, on both of these pictures, you'll see two different types of spinner knobs. Um, one is a pin so that if you have a hard time getting around the spinner knob, you can use a pin. This is a picture of a left foot accelerator. So you'll see three different um, pedals here. The one on the left is the left foot accelerator. So you would only use your left foot. You would go left to gas, center to brake. So it's the opposite of what you would do traditionally with the vehicle. These are a couple of different steering knobs. Um, and the reason they're different shaped is if you're having um, pain or um, range of motion issues with your hands, we can adapt how you hold the wheel um, to make it comfortable for you um, and easier to hold. Um, so I'm going to quickly, since I, I guess it's fine, it's fine, real quick, this here is a couple of different types of, so this is MPS. This one here is um, a picture of a different type of accelerator. You would push into brake and pull out to gas. Um, this one here is a floor mount. This one here is a floor mount. These two, they're on the right side, um, so they're a little bit lower. A lot of my clients like these floor mount ones because they can rest their elbow on the center console, um, and it's a little bit more comfortable for them. And then this one here is a mechanical one off to the left of the steering wheel. Um, where you would push down, of course, to brake and then pull back to gas. Um, there are two different types. There's a mechanical and electronic as far as steering goes, or I'm sorry, as far as gas and brake go. Um, mechanical is actually fixed to your gas and your brake, where electronic, the, um, the accelerator is rerouted and it's done electronically. So even if you step on the gas pedal with your foot, um, it's not gonna do anything because the electronics are rerouted to the hand controls themselves to this one. Um, the reason I'm not touching on um, like these like specific, like this is the one you're going to get is it is so client specific as far as equipment goes. Um, it's good to know what's out there, but that's where the driving specialist comes in to say, this is what's best for you based off of your circumstances. Um, I know in Texas, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know 100% with California, but the, kind of the process would be you see a driving specialist um, you get evaluated, you do your evaluation, um, and then you test with the equipment and then you have it installed in your vehicle. Um, I know Lynn's going to talk to you a little bit later, so and I know she's in California, so she'll be a great resource for that actual process. Um, 
just some additional suggestions because I do want to be able to give you guys some time for conversations and Lynn to tell you her experience. Um, I'm sure most of you already do this, but see your doctor regularly. So you know what the progression is your, of your neuropathy because when you understand the progression and you are on top of it, um, you can make better decisions and you can say, you know what, I think now is getting to be the time where I should be looking at these assistive technology and these adaptive equipment because I don't want to wait till it's too late. I don't want to wait until I, I'm there and I'm going, oh my gosh, I need to do this now. And then the process takes three or four months to get it done. And you're three or four, or six months without a vehicle that you can drive safely. Um, just always take your medications. Um, exercise and eat healthy is huge. Exercise, exercise, exercise. I'm an OT. I love exercise. Um, take care of your car and keep up regular maintenance. Um, and then this is kind of my own personal little thing. Um, set up a driving retirement plan. Um, there is going to be a point when you can no longer drive. I know that about myself. Um, anybody over the age of 50, at some point, there will be a time when you can't drive. So have a plan in place for when that time does come. All right. Oh, um, I guess the only other thing is that I did not mention is um, insurance price and um, cars, like you, we can pretty much adapt any vehicle. Um, take that out, like Subaru, and put it in. They are typically made specifically for the make and model of the car, so that is something to consider. If it is an absolutely American car, just came blue line. Um, some manufacturers of adaptive equipment haven't modified their vehicle, their equipment yet, those new vehicles. Um, so sometimes there is a lag in that respect. Um, as far as equipment go, time or cost goes, um, evaluations are not typically covered by insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, um, workers comps will cover it. We have what we call Texas workforce, which is voc rehab. A lot of times voc rehab will cover evaluations, install and equipment. Um, but just general insurance does not cover it. An evaluation can cost anywhere from four to $600. And then um, as far as the training goes, you could be anywhere from $100 to $200 an hour. And then um, as far as the equipment in the vehicle, um, just a basic set of hand controls um, will probably run you anywhere, or probably 18 to three, 1800 to 3000. And then it just goes up from there when you're looking at adapted vehicles with um, wheelchair accessibility and things like that. It just kind of goes up from there. Um, all right. So I think I've tried to cover a little bit of everything. I'd love to answer any questions that everybody has. So what I would like to do now is to hold questions a little bit more, if you don't mind. And then let's talk to us here, Lynn. And then after Lynn's talk, then we'll open it up for questions for uh, Meg, Megan and then also for Lynn. So Lynn, are you there? I, I am, I am. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna leave that up to you for now. Does that sound all right with you, Megan? Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna see if I can ah. figure out how to mute myself. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Lynn. Okay, thank you. Well, I hate to tell you, Megan, but I'm not in California. I'm in Washington state. <laughs> but, you know, everybody's experience will be different anyway. Um, I, um, I have to say that I retired um, a little more than 10 years ago from being the marketing director at a retirement community. It was a, a first class retirement community. And I used to really... Um, um, I, I have spent some time talking people out of driving. They're, they're, they'd bring their car, they'd sit it in the garage, and then when they wanted to use it, it had to be, it had to be uh, plugged in and, and uh, the battery had to be um, charged. And they just weren't using their car. And of course, this was uh, more than 10 years ago, so there wasn't the Uber that there is now. So I never, I, you know, I, I didn't have any problem trying to explain to people that, you know, they really could get, uh, get along without having to drive until it was my turn. And then um, my neuropathy was diagnosed over 30 years ago, and it's just been very slow. And I really didn't pay much attention to it until three or four years ago when it was really starting to to uh, affect me in many ways. And one of the ways it affected me was um, 
my feet weren't doing what my brain told them to do. And I was in denial, of course. And luckily, my first accident was we were rolling up to a stop sign. We, the, the truck in front of me and I was behind him. And I tried to stop and I just kind of slowly bumped into him. Luckily, it was a real high truck. I didn't hurt him at all. And of course, you know, $1,500 later, I had a new bumper. I also had a scratch on my on my fairly new um, leather shoes. And I thought, hmm, what does this mean? Um, but I, I kept, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to drive that much and that far. So I, you know, shoved it aside. And the next time I had a close call, my husband was in the car and uh, we were leaving a restaurant and I pulled out into traffic, meaning to stop as the driveway ended on a very busy road. And somehow I didn't stop. Luckily, the people who were would have hit us were smart enough to get out of my way. And then I couldn't find the the gas pedal to get out of their way. So my husband said, we need to have a little talk about this. <laughs> Do you realize that if somebody had had hit you or or we'd cause an accident, you know, it could have been a real problem. So uh, I said, yeah, he said, that's okay. I'll take you everywhere you need to go. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I'm a pretty active person uh, involved in League of Women Voters and different things. And that was just ridiculous. So the the I only knew somebody who um, made ramps for people and and uh, and did some of that work. So I asked him, did he know anybody that could? I, I knew that there. In fact, the reason I knew there were hand controls is I went to the um, Western Neuropathy Association. That's how I got involved. They had pictures, and I said, "Aha! This is what I need." But I didn't know how to go about it, so I talked to this friend who built ramps and he said, well, yeah, there's a place in Everett that does this, blah, blah, blah. So I called them up and I said, I want these hand controls. He says, well, wait a minute. I think you have to have a prescription from a, a therapist. I said, oh, well, give me a name. And I got a really good one. She's uh, uh, just uh, was so patient and did a lot of, uh, uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, well, she did the thing that you were talking about, Megan. She came to my house with this monstrous suitcase that stood up and, you know, she tested my ability to, um, my, what do you call that? Your, your vision on the sides. Um, she, she tested my strength. It was, it was quite an, a, quite a, an, not an ordeal, but you know, quite a thorough examination. And after that, she said, well, I have controls in my car. So I bring it to you and you practice. And once you get pretty good at it, then I will write you a prescription and you can order these controls. So um, it's not inexpensive, but I was determined and even more determined when our good friend who's a retired psychiatrist said to my husband, oh, she's she's been driving too long. She'll never figure out how to do this. It's, <laughs> boy, that made me even more determined. So I am, uh, let's see, I got my driver's license last fall. No, no, last spring. Because I was uh, driving a lot uh, this summer when my this last summer when my um, grandchildren came to visit and they let me they let me take my grandchild to a to a, a, a day camp they everybody was comfortable that I can drive just fine so it's been a godsend uh, luckily the the hand controls do not get in the way of my husband because we had only one car. And um, so somebody who doesn't need those hand controls just doesn't push the little button down below that says, I'm driving with hands now. And uh, so it, uh, it's, been, it's been great. The, um, the DMV test was a little mortifying. There were a couple of things I didn't pass. 
but I did pass well enough to get my driver's license in it. You know, when you were saying, Megan, that it expires, uh, you know, every once in a while, so you have to go back. Mine is until 2027. So that's that's pretty interesting. Of course, if I was ever in an accident, I'm sure they'd flag me. And, and it does say on the back of it that I can only drive with mechanical blah, blah, blah. So I understand that you can even rent cars uh, that have these uh, controls in them, but I didn't realize there were so many. Um, I have what's called a feather light and it, it's the um, um, toggle switch, you know, brake, gas, and then I have the round knob. The darn thing is you can't drink a cup of coffee or answer the phone or hardly turn on the radio. So I've had to had to behave myself. Um, so my my uh, uh, physical therapist is a member of the ADED, and you can you know whatever state you're in, you can go and find somebody and and see if if that would work for you. Um, their their hand controls are, and lessons are a little more expensive here in Washington State. I should have come to Texas. <laughs> so I'm I'm very pleased with uh, being uh, being able to drive, and uh, and really excited to share this information with with my wonderful friends at Western Neuropathy Association. Thank you. Lynn, that was awesome. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on kind of what you said because I didn't touch on that. Um, if you do go with the hand controls, it's a federal requirement that um, rental cars companies carry hand controls. Um, mm. it's, it's a it's an ADA requirement, so that you do have to have access sure. to that. It's not going to be the ones necessarily that you use at home, but you they need to at least carry them and provide them. Um, and there are incentives, and and I know in Texas, um, sales tax. There's no sales tax on um, equipment installed into vehicles. And then um, as far as new cars, you can get reimbursement from the different manufacturers, like a credit up to a certain amount. Like if you wanted to replace your car and have them reinstalled. Mm -hmm. So like Subaru, I think they credit $1,500 for adaptive mm -hmm. equipment. Um, Chevy, I think is 2000 uh, Toyota is something else. So if you're purchasing a new vehicle, um, you just have to fill it out and, and send it in and they, they'll they mail you a check basically. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. oh, thank you both. So let's open this up to some questions and um, <laughs> see if we can get a few folks to more information. So I have one question from Catherine. Uh, great presentation. It's mostly a comment uh, for, for both of you. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. I have a couple more questions that I can ask uh, until we maybe have a few more people ask a few more questions. And maybe I missed it, but what is the overall uh, general cost of doing this? Um, and Lynn, it sounds like you paid a little bit more. So yeah. I, yeah. So as far as investment goes, um, there's the initial upfront evaluation cost. And like I said, that's for me, it's $500. But then as far as training goes, the way I approach it as a, a specialist is whatever the client needs. I don't have a set amount because I've had clients who have driven boats, ran a motorcycle, driven stick shift their entire lives. And they all, and all of a sudden they get in the car and they're doing hand controls and it's like second nature for them and they pick it up in an hour or two. But then I have other clients who it takes 12 hours to pick it up. So it's, it's really hard to, to say every client needs 10 hours. You'll have some driving specialists that'll say as a minimum, this is how many hours you need. Um, but that's not, um, I know a lot of the people that I know in the community, we work what the client needs. And then there's the cost of the equipment itself. Um, like I said, really basic mechanical hand controls are around $3,000 because you're paying for the equipment and the installation. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you're, it's not just the equipment cost. You have to get it installed by a certified dealership. Mm -hmm. It's not just Bob's 
automotive down the street on the corner that can do what you want it to be installed right <laughs> by someone who knows what they're doing <laughs> and really 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 important please 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 do not buy it off of ebay or amazon oh <laughs> good point good good point good advice so i have a question from judith is there a national place to find a driving specialist and she lives in oregon yes so um and lynn did mention this adad the Association of Driver Rehab Specialists, the website is ADED.net. And you can put in your zip code and it will pull up someone in your area. Okay. Um, so another question also by Judith is, uh, does Medicare um, cover any of these costs? No. And then, or that, you know, for the hand or any installation or anything. What about the, obviously the training or, or not? Nope. Okay. okay. <laughs> and how do you find someone to sell and install the equipment? So most of the dealers in our area are, <coughs> excuse me, um, part of ADAD. Um, the overarching is NAMITA, the National Equipment and Mobi Mobility Dealers Association. So that's the kind of the organization that would certify any of the um, the dealers that put the, the equipment in the vehicle. Most driving rehab specialists um, will connect you with that organization once you've gone through the training. <laughs> um, question about how do you, um, let's see, how does it affect your insurance? It, you did not affect, it did not affect mine at all. I was quite pleased and surprised. They, they didn't care. <laughs> I, I've been told, I have not seen this personally, um, but I have been told that left foot accelerators, some insurance companies um, are more weary of them because your brain is used to going right to gas, left to brake. And the left foot accelerator is the exact opposite. So it's it's harder to learn and retrain where a hand control is new learning. Um, so it's something that you're not going to get confused and accidentally step on the gas pedal instead of the brake, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how about uh, maintenance on the equipment in the car? I get mine serviced yearly just to make sure. Lynn, what did they tell you? Uh, I don't remember hearing anything about it. I probably should read the book again. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't see anything that needs maintaining. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, usually, um, um, Oh, I was going to say, I was going to follow up on that. Um, I usually, when I have clients come to see me, I encourage them to have like an eight year plan. We don't want you to install a vehicle and then plan on getting rid of that vehicle next year because yeah. it is an investment. It's financially, it's a lot of money to put this in. So we want you to put this in your long term. Mm hmm. So here's a comment also by Catherine. It says, uh, if the Abilities Expo comes to your town, they have an example of the controls, lots of companies uh, on site to talk to you. Oh. So they, that's the Abilities Expo. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a, a touring group. Mm -hmm. huh. Is that correct? Will they go yeah. from city or town to town? Yep. Okay, good. Let's see here. I may have had one other. Oh, I was going to ask, um, how long does it take to install it once you have everything done and you are able to get a prescription for the equipment? Um, here with us, um, because you have to go through the DPS um, and we can't get it installed until you pass with the DPS, COVID has um, slowed the process down. So from start to finish, we're about looking at about three months. Okay. Ooh. Wow. Only because um, we can't even get DPS appointments. Like you get on and you can't get in for two months. So it's really the the delay is really in the in the vehicle um, administration. Correct. Yep. Um, during COVID, it was taking a long time to get the equipment in, but that seems to have kind of passed, and it seems to be coming in a little bit faster now. I don't know, Lynn. How long did yours take? Well, no, I um, I did all my training uh, in in. Um, uh, the and Jennifer's car and then uh, went and then I she gave me a prescription and I took took that and my car up to the uh, people that install it they ordered it um, 
And then when it was there, which was, you know, a matter of a week, maybe, mm -hmm. I brought my car up and left it all day and came and got it that night. Then I went to DMV and did my, in fact, <laughs> um, I just walked into DMV and they said, oh, no, you've got to make an appointment. You have to have a special person, blah, blah, blah. And that's down at that other DMV. I mean, I just, <laughs> I was just wandering around like a <laughs> yokel. <laughs> but it, I got done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we've covered all the questions everybody had. Um, I don't see any more in the in the question and answer group or the or the chat. Again, I want to say thank you both for a fantastic presentation. Uh, Megan, thank you for all the details and all the background and all the knowledge about the equipment and training and everything else. Lynn, thank you very much for sharing your experience and what you had to go through to get it all taken care of and how it works now for you. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you very much. And we appreciate everything uh, in terms of the presentation and information. Thank you so any, much. Any further comments or before we leave? I wanted to just mention that a few months ago, it may have been a year ago, Dr. Donovan, who has been a member of uh, WNA for some time, wrote an article about how you read an article, uh, you know, re read in the paper about an older person who got confused about which pedal they were pushing, which made him bristle. And it makes me bristle too. I don't think that we old people get confused. We just have neuropathy. And I know so many people who have neuropathy who just won't admit it or don't have never had it diagnosed. And, you know, it's not, it's not affecting their life quite as much as, I mean, I know my mother had it and I know, um, uh, a, f a friend of mine has it. It's just in her hands right now, but it, it's, um, it's, it's, um, what do I want to say? It's a stain on, on, on our older persons. <laughs> I'm going to be 80 in May and I, you know, I'm not going to put up with that. So whenever you see that, just don't believe it. We don't get confused. Yeah. We just, our feet, our feet don't tell, you know, do what our brain tells it to do. Anyway, thank you for letting me have my little soapbox. Oh, that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Megan. And thank you, Lynn. Appreciate thank you it. Much. You have a great day. And thanks. Sure. Take care. Thank you. Bye.